Okay, here we are. We are out at Pipewort Pond Nature Preserve today. In our journey of the Gospel of John, we have arrived at John chapter 4. And last time we stopped in verse 42, which concluded the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well and everything that happened there. And we're picking it up here in chapter 4, verse 43. And it says, Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. That is, he departed from the city of, uh, or village, of Sychar there, which is where he was by Jacob's well. And it says that he departed from there and went into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Now what he's referring to there is that he's getting ready to enter Galilee from Samaria. And Galilee is where Nazareth is. It's a town where he grew up. So I'm not real sure why it says it that way and why it brings up that a prophet hath no honor in his own country other than that maybe he thought that he could lay low there in Galilee because he didn't want to draw really a whole lot of attention yet because he had ministry that he had to fulfill before they would come and arrest him and all that because he knew what was going to happen. So I think that it's that he's trying to lay low so he's going to go in his own country. Okay, verse 45, it says, Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem, at the feast. For they also went unto the feast. Okay, so even though he was going there to lay low, um, it says that they received him well there in the land of Galilee. Because most of these people were practicing Jews who lived here and it was the law that they had to travel actually three times a year to Jerusalem for sacrifice and things like that so these Galileans that were here already knew about him or saw him when he was in Jerusalem and he caused all the hubbub there and chasing out the the money changers and all that and he stayed there for a little while and taught um, so they knew who he was. And uh, to explain that, why they had to travel like that, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, in verse 16 through 17, uh, Moses is talking to the people there and telling them the law and reiterating things from the law. And he says, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. Those three feasts, every year, all the males were required to travel to Jerusalem. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. So they were to bring sacrifices for atonement for, for sins or, or whatever. I'm not, I'm not an expert on the law of Moses, really. I know there was 630-some laws that they had to follow. But this is why the people there in Galilee knew who he was, because they were required to go there, and they were there at Passover when Jesus was there. Okay, now in verse 46... It says, so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. So Capernaum is, I looked at the map and it looks like it's roughly 20 to 25 miles from Cana of Galilee. So this nobleman there is... Uh, 20 to 25 miles away 
from his son who was sick in Capernaum. And it says, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. Okay, so he's approaching Jesus in Cana of Galilee and he's requesting him to come to Capernaum with him, which is 20 to 25 miles away. And it says that he wanted him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. <laughs> and this is just something that he was, he was putting his feelings out there. That's, that's how he felt about it. And that really is how it was. He had to perform this miracle of turning the water into wine just to uh, verify things for his followers. He needed more than just his word to say these things because it's just our nature to want proof of things. And that's what he's saying. Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. But he, he desires for us to believe uh, without having to prove himself. He wants us just to believe without having to show proof. Remember, he said to Thomas, because you've seen, you know, Thomas insisted on seeing the wounds in his hands and putting his hand in his side and all that and to see proof that Jesus was risen. He wouldn't believe otherwise. And Jesus said, blessed are they who believe and have not seen. You, you believe because you see, but blessed are those they have not seen and yet believe. But the narrative goes on in verse 49. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way. Thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. See? Because Jesus had just made this statement, unless you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. But he did believe. Jesus said, your son's fine. Go home. He's healed. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth and himself believed and his whole house. So he figured out the timing and everything. And it was where his son was healed at the same time that Jesus said that he lived is what it's saying here but then it says that he believed and his whole house so his whole family then believed that Jesus was the Messiah this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee so it's basically saying that that's, that's the second miracle that he did publicly anyway. The first one was turning the water into wine, and this was the second one. Because as you see back when you look in, in uh, you know, John 2 and 3, and the first part of this chapter, he really didn't do any miracles. It was all teaching and of course, you could consider it a miracle when he knew all about the woman at the well. That was supernatural knowledge, which to me is a miracle because no ordinary person would know the things that he knew unless he was who he said he was. But it's saying that that's, that was the, the second visible miracle, public miracle. Okay. Now we're going to go into John chapter 5 here, 
and it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, and withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Okay, now when it says there, uh, a great multitude of impotent folk, it's that the impotent, there's no uh, sexual connotations there. They're afflicted with some type of illness, you know, um, blind, halt, meaning that they have trouble walking or something, withered. And now, this section of scripture, now depending on what version of the Bible you read, I stick with the King James, New King James maybe, Amplified, um, the Holman Christian Standard is a good translation, but I generally stick with the King James and uh, if you'll notice that the last part of verse 3 and verse 4 is completely removed in a lot of the modern Bible translations, okay? And what it says there, starting in verse 3, it says, In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel, now this is verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So this explains why the people were waiting for the moving of the water to get into the water. This was a superstition, of course. Um, I don't believe that there was any angel stirring the water or causing people to be healed that stepped down in there. But that was a superstition that they had at the time. Now, when, when they did these modern Bible translations, um, they were comparing texts and things like that. And what they say, I don't know if this is true or not, but they say that the earliest versions of the Gospel of John that they have do not include that part. Okay, they say that it was put in later. All right, um, but it is there in the King James in the regular numbering. It's odd because a lot of the modern Bibles, you'll see that there is no John 5, 4. It skips straight from 3 to 5 and it omits that last section of verse 3 that says waiting for the moving of the water. Now, when you move on in this passage, you'll see that he's explaining to Jesus that he's waiting for the moving of the water to get down in there. So it doesn't make sense. By, by removing verse 4, the reader does not understand why people are waiting for the moving of the water. So this causes a big problem. It, it shouldn't be removed. I believe it should be there. I, I love the King James translation. And personally, I want all that I can get. I don't, I don't like things being removed from the Word of God. So, now their superstition was that they would lay there and they, they'd, they'd sit there, these people that were sick, and they'd wait for the moving of the water. Uh, and then they'd get down into the water and they believed that they would be healed from whatever was wrong with them. Now, in verse 5, it goes on, and a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, lying there, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Will he? Will he be made whole? He's asking him, for his belief. He wants to hear that the man believes it and he wants it. The impotent man answered him, Sir, 
I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So see, see his issue here? He's laying there waiting for the moving of the water and the first one in is the one that's supposed to be healed according to their superstition. So but the, he sees the water move and then he tries to get in there and somebody else gets in there before him because he's lame and he has trouble moving. Jesus saith unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. So this happened on the Sabbath day. Now, in verse 10, the Jews, therefore, of course, they're very, very religious people. And they, they believed in adhering exactly to the law of Moses. You know, you better not step out of line on any of these 630 ordinances or else. <laughs> you know, so verse 10, it says, The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. <laughs> But, you know, if you read the story, he's not working. You know, he, he was healed. And Jesus said, you know, take up your bed and walk. Well, he's healed now. He's walking. He's not going to leave it there. If it belonged to him, he's going to take it with him, take it home or whatever. <laughs> but they say, it's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Verse 11, he answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? <laughs> and he that was healed wist not who it was. Wist is an old English word that means he didn't know. He, he, he couldn't tell he didn't know who it was that said it to him. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. So after Jesus uh, told him to take up his bed and walk, he got out of the way. Because there was obviously a crowd there. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now, that brings up the idea of this being a conditional healing. <laughs> Maybe. Sin brings many things on people. It can bring sickness. It can bring uh, just problems in your life. It can bring all kinds of problems. So, yeah, Jesus said to him, uh, sin no more. So that nothing worse than what you had will come on you. And, you know, it, it, get, it gives the whole idea that uh, sin can bring problems, you know, sometimes physical problems. Now, I can relate with this in a way. Um, if you listen to my testimony, uh, you'd hear this in the testimony where um, when I was first saved, I quit drinking and everything like that and straightened my life up. And I was sober for almost four years. And I started having problems in my life again. And I, I jumped off the wagon and I started drinking again. Okay. Um, it was much worse. It was worse the second time. The trouble that I got into and the horrible things that happened. Now, I had already been saved. But once I went back... You know, Jesus says here, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now for me, in my case, in that situation, 
it was sin for me to go back into that kind of lifestyle after I had been delivered from it, see? So it, it was sin when I went back and started drinking and, and living that kind of lifestyle again. And, you know, he said, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Well, that's exactly what happened. Worse things came unto me. So it is, it is conditional. In a lot of ways, it is. Um, each of us has a calling in our lives, and there's, there's a path that, that God wants us to go on. And if we don't obey, the obedience is required, <laughs> even though people, a lot of people try and say that it, it isn't required. Well, it's, it's not really required, but it is to have a successful life and to move ahead and to be in the will of God. And I believe even to be considered one of his children. If you aren't going to listen to him, then, then you've gone astray. You've gone astray from the path. And whose child are you then? We are the servants of whoever we obey, see? So if we go out of the way and we don't listen to, to the Lord's leading and we follow the devil, who is the God of this world, <laughs> like Bob Dylan said, you gotta serve somebody. It's either the devil or the Lord, one of the two. So if you're not following the Lord, who are you following then? And whose child are you? Okay, so anyway, back to the text here. Jesus says to him, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole because they wanted to know. They asked him, who was it? Who was it that told you to pick up your bed and walk? So he tells them that it was Jesus that, that did this. Verse 16, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. <laughs> In other words, he's saying, God doesn't stop working on one particular day. My father works all the time, and so I work too. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't like that. Um... Then in verse 18, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God, which he, he is. He is. The son is in the father and the father in the son. Now, in Mark 2, verses 27 and 28, Jesus is talking to the people, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for us. We weren't created for the Sabbath, you know. The Sabbath day was put in place so that we would have a day of rest. So that we do all our work in six days and then rest on the Sabbath day. You know, and, and he's just saying, you know, that's what, what the Lord did when the earth was created. He, he made the earth in six days and then rested on the seventh. So that's done as an example, as a pattern it's not made to be uh, 
a law that's that's adhered to in that way. Now, some people would say, but it's the fourth commandment. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Yes, this is true. But we also have to remember that in Christ, the law is fulfilled. He fulfilled the law and took all those ordinances out of the way. The law is written on our hearts. Um, there's a lot of dispute among this in the church. I know uh, the Seventh Day Adventists, they make a great big deal out of it. In the way that if, if you don't celebrate the Sabbath or observe the Sabbath on Saturday, and you're not going to heaven. That's actually what they believe. Um, I go to church on Sunday. If they had services on Saturday, maybe I'd go on Saturday instead. Um, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Okay. Then again, in Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 6, he said, One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. So what he's saying here to the church, don't make a big deal about Sabbaths or times or you, you, you have to uh, worship at this particular time on this particular day and you have to work on this particular day but not on this particular day. We aren't bound to that in Christ. That was something old. That was part of the law. These things, these things are passed away in Christ. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is just something that we should all know. As Christians, we should understand this very well. And then uh, in Hebrews, it says to uh, not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, and especially even more so as we see the day approaching. And the day of the Lord is definitely approaching. So it's a good idea to have Christian friends and to have fellowship one with another. Uh, but don't make, make it uh, a requirement to go to church on, on one particular day or another and then, and then put the burden on, on people to say, you have to do this or you're not going to heaven or you're not saved if, if you don't worship God on this particular day. That is not Christ. That is not what we have with our salvation. It doesn't go along with it. That goes along with all these old ordinances that the, that the Jews were trying to force on the people back then. And there's still people trying to force this on the body of Christ. So remember that uh, we are free. We are free in Christ. He has made us free from the law of sin and death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together. And I ask that you'd bless your word going forth. Lord, bless all my friends. Um, enlighten them and guide them in their way. 
Lord, we thank you for it. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you all for listening today. And uh, I have a long walk back. <laughs> I have a pretty long walk back. This is a long way walking out here today. And I haven't seen a single person come by here the whole time I've been here talking. It's kind of nice because it's uh, uninhibiting to me to be able to talk this way. I love you all, and I'll see you the next time around. Bye-bye.